Hello, welcome to the PowerNumbers.com YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Claude Anderson here again with you uh, on connecting the dots. And today we're going to connect some dots. And um, again, on a Q&A uh, based format, I'm going to address one other question that was raised, uh, I guess, maybe a couple of months ago, where I got a couple of lap, uh, responses on the email saying, Dr. Anderson, you know, you, you, you talked a lot about racism being a team sport and how we need to play as a team and uh, we, how we be, need to be more race conscious rather than uh, contrary to what whites say, we're too race conscious. You keep saying we're not race conscious enough. And if we're not race conscious enough, could you please walk through and give us some principles of things that we should be doing immediately if we're gonna survive what's coming up in the society and become a competitive people as quick as we can so we can compete in this so-called pluralistic society that continues to treat black folk as a third rail ignore them and take them for granted in politics and social constructs and everything else. Tell us what, give us some things, identify it for us so we can go about using them as quickly as possible. So what I want you to do is take, take out your pencil. Let me, let me run through and name some things I want you all to start doing. It's extremely, extremely important. Um, you want to get your paper, get your pencil. Let's start off. A few years ago, I tried to, I sent a newsletter to Obama telling him some things he could recommend for black folks since he was, he had the honor of being the first black president in the United States. But again, he didn't do any of them. He ignored it. And so what I'm going to do now is, is go back and recapture some of those things that he failed to recognize and use. And a lot of most of it's also things I'm going to recommend are contained in my books, Black Labor, White Wealth, and also Power Nomics, the National Plan, and also the Black History Reader. So let, let me give you some things. You write them down as I go through them. And I'm going to try not to talk too fast. I don't want to make a long uh, video out of this one, so let's try to number some, some things. The first thing I think you need to do is try to come together. I don't care whether you get two or three of your friends or your neighborhoods or anybody in your neighborhood as a group, pull them over to your house, have a meeting and say, one well, of the first thing we have to do is, is a, identify a group self-interest based on our uniqueness, our, our special dilemma, our special history, so we can, have, so we can do what? form a group self-interest. One thing we've never had in this country for black folk that's collectively understood is a group self-interest. And, and, and based, that's the first thing. And that should be based and tied in with recovering what was stripped from you during slavery. Besides your wealth, they also stripped your social cohesiveness. Now, once you put those things in place with a group self-interest and begin to focus on getting um, some kind of group cohesiveness, now let's start to focus on some of the principal things you should do. Number one, what I would suggest you start doing is to first try to figure out how to build a function, fill, build functional black communities. Get away from neighborhoods. A neighborhood is totally useless. There is no power in living in a neighborhood. A neighborhood is where you eat and sleep. It is totally useless. It's dis dysfunctional. There is no wealth building in a neighborhood. It is impossible in theory and practice to be a competitive people living in a neighborhood. And that's wide open. It has nothing in it. That's why it's been so it's been so corrupted and become so crime written. And most people have moved away from neighborhoods. And now the neighbor has gone away to a suburbs or someplace else. The only thing left is a hood. That's why you hear black people talking about I live in the hood. What they're saying there's nothing in there. And see, a neighborhood is like a it's like a hotel where it's where people eat and sleep and come and go. You don't know your neighborhood. You don't know who, who you, who's, who's living up over you or beside you. And therefore, it's easy for somebody to rip you off, shoot at you at your own neighborhood because they don't care about you or know who you are. You don't have what you should have, which is a community. You got to build a community. And if you build a community, you must have three elements in it to be a community. One, you must have a wholly independent economic structure. Two, you must have a code of conduct that tells you how and request how, what you need to do in terms of supporting, caring for, buying from, and employing those people who, who look like you, have your own cosmetic identification. That, and three, you must have elected officials from that, neighbor, from that community who will represent you in all times and all issues and put your interests first and foremost. Though you must have those three elements to have a community. Consequently, we are the only people in America that do not have not one single solitary community. That's the first thing you must have is community. Next thing you must have, you must also create a, a, a sense of community. Why a sense of community? Once you build that community, you must develop a sense of community. That's a feeling 
a feeling that you are special people and that you're united and bound together by your cosmetic appearance and by your collective experiences, bad and good as black folk in this country. Now, once you get that sense of community, that sense of community becomes like a roof. It becomes a roof, like a major big tent. Like you go to a football stadium, you got a ceiling over it. That sense of community is your protectiveness. A sense of community protects you from people coming in from the outside that want to penetrate and bring in drugs, anything else, uh, hot cars or, or prostitution, or just somebody come in and rob, or they come in and dump garbage on your vacant lots. Your sense of community will protect you if you got a very strong sense of community. That's why in most of these, these, these immigrant groups, they have a strong sense of community. That's why nobody, you just can't bring up it, bring in a business in the, in, in the, in the neighborhood that's, that's immigrant based. You can't go into, blacks can't go into Chinatown and put up restaurants and businesses. They can't go in little Italy. They can't go in Jewish town. They can't go in little Mexican town, little Havana, a little community, uh, a little Cuba and put up businesses because they got a very strong sense of community that says you can't come in here and do that. We protect our own businesses first and foremost and buy from our own people. The third thing you must do once you get that strict sense of community going to protect you, the next thing you must do is create an economy in there. That economy means that you learn how to buy from your own people in that community. Buy from products, goods, services that are produced by your own people. And because when you, once you buy from it, then, then you create jobs for your own people. It makes no sense for you to be educating black kids to leave their own community and go over to somebody else's community looking for a job. Other groups don't want you in their communities. They have no comfort in your coming into their community, sitting at the front door and trying to, and trying to represent what we, they call equality or equal opportunity. They don't want you in their neighborhood. They don't want you in their business. That's why, the, that's why Asians have said repeatedly, even this, in the Wall Street Journal, that they, under no circumstances, will they ever hire a black person in a Chinese restaurant or an Asian restaurant. They aren't going to do it. Only black folk will do that. And they're not going to buy from you. They have a very strong sense of community that is controlled by their, by their sense of community. They can regulate and control. The next thing I want you to do, once you get that, 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 that alternative economy going, buy from your own people and make your money do what? On the fourth point, bounce eight to 12 times. Don't go out and just spend your money in any business. Spend your money first and foremost with your own people and make it bounce around and around again. Even if you don't like the person that you're buying it from, you don't have to be in love with every black person you go in the store you go into. Just respect yourself by going in there and the owner of that business should be respectful of you. Every, if you own a black business, as soon as another black comes in, you should rush to the door and say, welcome, glad you're here. I'll do anything in the world to provide you with high quality, good service and good products. And, that, and so the people have some respect. And even if the product is not the best, that, that, that a store next door might be white or someone else is selling, have selling products similar to yours, buy from your own people first and foremost and tell the black person that as soon as he gets a chance to, uh, to uh, on a cost benefit analysis, to use that money to improve the quality of that store and the business and the services. The next point I want you to learn how to do is begin to um, establish, establish safe business in those communities. That means once you build a community, uh, if necessary, I don't care if you set up some kind of security services, take some of those gangs you got in the neighborhood and help some of those gangs or the Crips and Bloods, have them set up security services. They say, hey, why don't you start a security service? So we have a code of conduct, <clears throat> which means that you have a security service and a protection agency that, that and hang a sign <clears throat> on the perimeters of that black community saying, hey, <clears throat> we will not permit any crime in this neighborhood. Just like the like the mafia and organized crime do, you can't go into those in, in in Italian neighborhoods and rob the stores. Some of those stores can stay open all night; and nobody breaks in them because there's a code of conduct and they protect it. People says the mafia will get you if you break in our stores. Black folk can use even their criminal elements begin to protect their own people, their own businesses, and make sure it's safe. And that's put up a sign in that community saying you're now entering a safe zone. Make your businesses a safe zone. For for women and black children to be able to go out there and feel comfortable without having to be raped and robbed and mistreated and violated. <clears throat> Next thing I want you to do is to learn how to dominate in businesses. Dominate in businesses wherever you dominate in products, services, and goods and spending your dollars. Always spend your make your money bounce eight to 12 times before it leaves. Dominate, start businesses based on where your consumer power is going. That means that right now, black folks spend more money on seafood than anybody else. Black folks spend 
said black folk eat three to four times more seafood than whites. They spend nine dollars for every dollar, one dollar that whites spend on, on seafood. So learn how to control the seafood industry from the bottom to the top. Blacks buy more leather, both in wear and in and and and, and, uh, and hardware. Leather. They should be starting a leather business in this country. Where black folk are going to try to dominate and, and leather wear. <clears throat> right now, most of the leather that the blacks are buying is either coming in from Asian countries, or uh, which is rough leather, or, or polished leather coming in from Italy. But and you can use it for furniture, whatever you want to do. Get into the leather business, and I'll tell you later how you look in, look in the book Power Numbers, how you set up a leather business in the United States by dealing rather with Asians or dealing with Italians. <clears throat> you can go down and deal with Haitians and set up a leather business. So you dominate, you spend about 40% uh, of all the money for, for theater tickets, but you don't have any movie theaters. Black folk drink about 43% of all the scotch liquor, but you don't produce it in the scotch liquor. Dominate in business wherever you dominate in consumer pattern where you're spending your money. <clears throat> Next thing I want you to do is construct those vertical business. Once you start a business, don't, don't compete against other blacks. If you got one, two black, black barbershops on, on, in, in the town, be careful and go and put another black barber shop down the street or around the corner. Go across town or someplace else, if, and so you won't be crabbing each other. And then once you get the other, get them all established, then the next business come in. Don't be just a, a, be a barber shop. Be a supplier of products and services and goods that a barber shop would be buying. So you go vertical. You t you go to each one of those barber shops. Say, look, if I if I can produce the towels, the soap, and the lotions, would you buy it for me and I'll provide it to you? Then you go down, then and you have some kind of a commitment and obligation to buy your products from from your own people going vertical, from producing to warehousing to wholesaling, then retailing. That's vertically ordered, and you buy strictly from your own people first and foremost in a vertical ordered system. So try to build businesses and, and build them straight up and down. Don't go horizontal. If you go horizontal, you're crabbing. Go straight up and down rather than horizontal. And another couple of points here for you. Uh, uh, let's see, I have point another here on my team. Oh, we're on a balance of trade. Start to learn how to practice, to require a balance of trade, which means don't let all these dependencies coming in your neighbors sucking the money out. I go into black neighbors right now, and about 97% of all the businesses in there are outside entities, are either rotating minorities or national businesses coming into the black community. The McDonald's, the Burger Kings, the Taco Bells, they're coming in extracting the money out of your neighborhood, and they don't put anything back. They leave a balance of trade deficit. They come in and bring, bring products in, sell those products to you, you consume it, they take your money out. And that goes on every day in every black community in America, which means that every night, every black community in America goes bankrupt at seven o'clock when all those businesses that are in black neighborhoods close their doors and clean out the cash register and go back to the suburbs. Black, black businesses, black neighborhoods go bankrupt. And they are bankrupt all night until the next day when the whites come back or the, or the immigrants come back and open up those doors, and then you go back again, you begin to conduct business, but it's not your business, it's their business. When well, you're bringing their money and displacing your capital into their hands so they can again pay for their children to go to college, put food on their table and pay their rent and mortgage. Quit displacing your capital. You know, make your money bounce eight to 12 times. You got about a $1.3 trillion worth of income, use it and double it, make it, and you'll be a powerful group in this country by not letting all these other businesses coming in your community, putting up those businesses and extracting the capital out and saying, we're giving you jobs and a service. No, you provide the jobs and service for your own people. The next thing I want you to do is to major in industries, again, that are where, that, that in some of those industries that the United States displaced back in the civil rights movement. This country used to produce the best shoes in the country and in the world. We produce about 92% of all the major products up into the civil rights movement. That was shoes, television, radios, cars, automobiles, dishware, furniture, all that was being produced here in America. All those industries were, were intentionally displaced into third world nations to give them a chance to build industries and, uh, and have employment opportunities and build wealth. You should go back and demand some of those jobs come back to America. And you started building your factories here in, in this country, your industries, and so the money will not go out of stay in this country where you can provide jobs and wealth to your own people. A lot of those industries can come back. You can make gym shoes in this country if you wish to. You don't have to. You don't have to be sending six, seven, seven hundred dollars for a damn pair of gym shoes. You can. You can build gym shoes industry in this country and build a decent pair of gym shoes for maybe fifty or sixty dollars. 
But again, build your own industries and, and recapture what was given away to the civil rights movement, a move out of this country, the third world countries, so they could enrich themselves with jobs and opportunities. The next point <clears throat> I want to say to you is form, form some kind of saving institutions where you can start placing your money in credit unions or even in, uh, in banks that will hold that money for you and, and not let it leave your community. Right now, black folk have, have about 100, <clears throat> about, I guess they got about 65,000 black churches, about 122,000 black ministers. And out of the disposable income, 99% of, of our money goes into those banks every, every Monday morning. They take the money to banks that don't even belong to black folk, the credit unions don't belong to black folk, or saving the loans don't belong to black folk. Start to set up your own business institutions that can hold your capital for you and keep it in your own community. You can borrow it on a long-term, low-cost basis and uh, so that you can use it because right now, most of these big banks will not lend black folk any money at all. And they're very cons ultimately conservative. The next point I want to mention to you, which is important, I'm going to stop at this point, is that <clears throat> you got to be prepared now to push back. This country is now moving to, being, to implementing a national, national genocide program against black folk in this country. It's going to be coming out in the form of of, of, of effeminizing the entire the black males in America. They're going to feminize them and neutralize them just like they did throughout history. Neuter them because racism is a man-to-man -man issue. That's how it started out, white men against black men. What they're going to do then is try to feminize blacks in this country through either a gay movement or a transgender movement, and that's going to hurt the, not only the family, the black community, and black to black race, but it's going to reduce the ability of black folk to be a competitive people as a as a man to man against white racism in America, and they're going to do that. That's going to be moving. It's, a lot of it's going to be pushed by Hollywood through all levels of media. So watch out for that. And begin to push it back and say, no, we are not going for that. Because that because if you do go for it, the black man in America will become an endangered species. He'll be endangered because he's been he's been neutralized through our country through various forms of castration, physically and psychologically and emotionally and political. So push back and be prepared to deal with that. Now that wraps it up for today, this Q&A, and I'll see you the next time on the powernumbers.com YouTube channel and Connecting the Dots. I'm Dr. Claude Anderson. Stay, stay healthy, stay alert, and remember, keep the faith for our people. Take care. Bye-bye.